bring into this conversation senior advisor to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, Mark Regev. Mr. Regev, thanks for being with us again this morning. Um, let me ask you about that meeting yesterday between National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan and Prime Minister Netanyahu, among others in the room, where the National Security Advisor brought with him from the White House the plan that the fighting should sort of wind down, the bombing should wind down, and that the United States would like within three or four weeks to see the strategy from Israel change to be more focused to troops, to commandos going in to rescue hostages, to target Hamas leaders that way, all with the idea of minimizing civilian casualties. What's your response to that idea? So we had a good good conversation, I, I think, yesterday with the National Security Advisor. Uh, uh, look, Israel and the United States, we agree on the strategic aims, which is, you know, Israel has to act. We have to protect our people. It's our obligation as a government to, to, to remove this threat on our southern frontier, this terror enclave run by Hamas, that Hamas must be removed from power in any post-conflict situation. Hamas can no longer have that military machine in Gaza and it can no longer rule the Gaza Strip. So on the big strategic issues, there's, there's uh, eye to eye, Washington and Jerusalem. Now, how we fight this war, uh, obviously, uh, uh, you can have different approaches, uh, different opinions. Uh, we share the goal that uh, Israel, as we pursue Hamas, and we will pursue Hamas, and we will destroy Hamas, that we have to take uh, steps to safeguard the civilian population, as we have been doing, and, of course, to facilitate the entrance of humanitarian support for the civilian population. And we're, uh, we're, we're talking about beefing up our effort in, in both those, those areas. So, Mr. Rega, we'll stipulate again, as we do every time we talk about this, that Hamas uses civilians. It puts civilians between itself and Israeli bombs. That is a strategy. That's no secret. So part of the reason civilians are dying is that. But would you agree that too many civilians are dying and that a change of strategy as proposed by the United States would be a good idea to minimize civilian casualties in this war? So, of course, we want to keep civilian casualties as low as is possible. And, and you rightly say there are issues here because Hamas has got the opposite strategy. But uh, I think what we were seeing in the numbers recently, we're seeing the, uh, the numbers of civilian casualties going down. And that's because fighting is winding up in the north and in the south. Uh, the introduction of uh, the ground forces has allowed us to be even more surgical. And our goal, once again, is to get those civilian casualties as low as is possible while pursuing the fight against Hamas. And, and you asked me about a timeline. It's important that we finish this uh, uh, correctly, because to finish this with, with Hamas still in power, that's, that's obviously just a Band-Aid solution. Uh, you know, Hamas says openly that they would uh, attack Israel again, given the capability, given the opportunity, they would do another October 7th, they'd do it again and again and again, their words. And so it's, it's crucial that this ends with a, a, a decisive defeat for Hamas, that their military machine is destroyed, and that there's a new reality in Gaza. Uh, I think anything short of that, it means that everything that we've, what we've gone through has been wasted. It's important that we finish this uh, and achieve our goals. And the timing for that we can discuss, but it's crucial that the ghost goals are met. So, uh, Mark, this is David Ignatius in Washington. Just uh, two, two questions I wanted to ask. Uh, first, um, is it possible that you could move to a new phase in the campaign that you're describing to destroy Hamas's political power that would be, uh, as U.S. officials have said, more precise, more surgical, uh, more of your commando units, more intelligence-driven, fewer uh, 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 bombing t tank attacks? That's the first question. And then the second question involves whether Israel might be prepared at some point, under some conditions, to renew the talks through gutter with Hamas. It's been reported that, that David Barnea, your Mossad chief, was ready to go back to Doha and continue those talks, but there was a, basically a political decision, no, we're not going to do that now. When might those talks resume? So on the first question about the stages, so it's important to finish the current stage correctly before you go on to the next stage. And it's clear we've now got a stage of intensive fighting. 
And when we have achieved the goals of that stage, uh, uh, we can move to the more the counterinsurgency stage, the, the stage that you've referred to, which is the um, uh, uh, the stage of using maybe more commando forces and based on intelligence and so forth. Uh, uh, but we have to finish the current stage. We have to be able to deal with these battalions of Hamas fighters that are still active in the south. Uh, you know, in the north, things are moving ahead very, very uh, well. Uh, we've had uh, surrenders. Uh, more and more Hamas uh, terrorists are surrendering. They're coming out, their hands raised, their, their rifles, their AK-47s held over their head. That's good. We're seeing uh, the Hamas military machine in northern Gaza break. It's only a matter of time that that happens in the south. And it, as, as those events uh, you know, move ahead, then we can uh, move to the next stage. But it's important to finish the current stage before going to the next stage. On the second question about the hostages, obviously releasing the hostages, getting them out is, is crucial for Israel. It's one of our central aims. And if there was a serious proposal on the table for a release of hostages, as we've done in the past, we would not let that go by the wayside. The question is, is there, a, is there such a serious proposal on the table? And there are always discussions. It came up in the meeting yesterday with the National Security Advisor, with Sullivan. Uh, Israel will not uh, let a, a serious opportunity for the release of hostages uh, go, you know, no, go unanswered. You know, I, I just want to jump in. You know, it's, it, it's easy to say, you can't be a human and not say, of course, we don't want innocent civilians killed. But this is war. And just like in taking out Nazis or Al-Qaeda or ISIS, unfortunately, civilians are going to be killed. Israel is in a position that, like it or not, their existence is on the line. And, and as, as our guest has said, that I, I, uh, Hamas has said over and over, we want to kill every Jew, every Israeli. And no other country in a wartime situation is put in the same position as Israel. They were innocent Germans who died because the Nazis had to be killed. Hamas has to be killed. If New Jersey was Hamas and New York was Israel and New Jersey was saying to New York, we are going to obliterate you, would New York be under the same conditions to, oh, we have to do it, you know, surgically? Of course Israel wants to do it surgically. Israel is not dumb. Israel knows it's Israel is hurting their brand. And Israel is also built on humanity. It is a Western civilized culture. And I just keep coming back to this is a Rubik's Cube. We want Israel to defend itself. Israel has a right to defend itself. Yet, if there are innocent civilians killed somehow, it backfires on Israel. This is war. It's horrible. It's terrible. But I don't know what Israel's choices are, actually. You know, can I respond to that? Because, yes. I mean, if you compare Israel to perfection, we fall short. And our own stated goal is minimum secure, uh, civilian casualties, and obviously we've had too many. But I think if you compare what the Israel Defense Forces are doing with Gaza and the steps that we're taking, and you compare that with other real-world situations where people have been fighting terrorists in urban built-up areas, whether we're in the struggle against ISIS in uh, Iraq or in Syria, they're the most recent examples. I think when you look at the number, the ratio, you know, the, this is what the experts look at, the ratio between combatants and civilians who, who are fatalities, yes? I think when compared to comparable situations, the IDF's efforts to safeguard civilian population, whether it's in the warnings and uh, directing people to leave areas of combat and the precision of our munitions and so forth, it's true. Civilians have been killed, but I think in the comparative situation, you'll see that Israel's actually done very well in saving civilian lives. <clears throat> Mr. Ambassador, um, we, we've all said here, and I know you have, and, and Benjamin Netanyahu has throughout his career, have all talked about how Hamas is a terrorist group that wants to kill Jews, wants to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. Um, many Americans questioning uh, the news reports that came out that said even weeks before this attack, Netanyahu's government was instructing Qatar to keep billions of dollars. Qatar asking the Netanyahu government, should we continue funding Hamas? Uh, and they have to the tunes of billions of dollars through the years. And the Netanyahu government said yes, just three weeks before, in a meeting in Doha, just three weeks before the attacks, uh, the Netanyahu government said, keep funding Hamas. A lot of Americans would like to know why in the world 
would the Netanyahu government ever do that? And a lot of Israelis also have questions. It's not just Americans, yeah? It's, it's our people who were killed in, in the terrible massacre of October 7th. And there's a whole series of questions. There's the, the intelligence failure. How is it that as a country, Israel prides itself on having excellent intelligence services? And yet, we, we, we had no warning. Despite now, it's becoming clear that there was information there. It, it, never, it, it never got into the system in a way that people uh, said there's an emergency. And we weren't ready on October 7th to face the attack. Then there are questions of how did they cross the fence and, and, and enter our communities? What happened to the defences on the ground? And there are questions, how long did it take the IDF to get there to those places and save the people who could be saved and take control of our territory again? There's a whole series of questions. And of course, you're right in asking, uh, what did the, the prime minister know? When did he know it? Uh, the head of the army, the head of military intelligence, the head of the Shin Bet. Uh, and you go all the way down to the Southern Command that faces the soldiers who face Gaza. So there are all these questions will have to be asked. But uh, as, as David knows, uh, uh, we had a similar uh, or a comparable, I should say, situation in 1973, exactly 50 years ago, when Israel was surprised uh, in the north and in the south, a surprise attack from Syria and, uh, and Egypt, the Yom Kippur War. And uh, when that was over and we managed to turn the tables, even though it started off very badly for Israel, uh, there right. was a commission of inquiry, uh, uh, questions were asked, uh, uh, politicians, the uh, prime minister, Golda Meir at the time, was brought before the commission to answer questions, the military, and there were uh, decisions were made. Israel's a democratic country, we have checks and balances, we have a way that all these questions will be looked into.